What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. Today, we have NFL star J.J. Watt joining the show. You might know him from his time currently on the Arizona Cardinals, but, you know, this guy was a first-round pick a little bit over a decade ago. Three-time Defensive Player of the Year. He holds all types of records when it comes to, you know, sacks, most sacks in the season, five-time Pro Bowler, and also just kind of like famous for his personality. Really big on philanthropy, super active on social media, always like doing this cool stuff, flying fans out. We talked about all of it. So one of my favorite conversations we've had on the show so far, we're going to just go over, hear from our partners at Oracle Nest Suite right now, and then we'll be right back with JJ. 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you have the dot-com crash and the housing crash and whatever roller coaster we're going through right now. But one thing is certain, it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials. Also, your inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, really everything. So you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve your margins. Everything you need in one place when you're trying to prepare for uncertain times, just remember NetSuite. This is going to help you save money. This is going to help you understand what's happening with all those costs. Automate a couple things. And 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. So you should go ahead and give it a try. Right now is a perfect time because NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. So head over to NetSuite.com slash my other passion. Go there right now, NetSuite.com slash my other passion. Check it out. See how it works for your business. You definitely won't regret it. All right, JJ Watt, welcome to the show. How you doing today, man? Good, man. How are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well, man. It's it's awesome to have you here. I mean, you know, you certainly know your own list of accomplishments, but it is impressive. To look at it: three time Defensive Player of the Year, five time Pro Bowler, Stacks Leader twice, right? <laughs> You know, a couple seasons with uh, 20 plus sacks, which I think is an NFL record. What, how do you feel at this point in your life? Like, you know, you've made, if, if one looks up things on the internet, looks at your contracts, you know, you've done well for yourself as uh, we're about the same age, right? Early, mid 30s, you know, nine figure type contracts over the course of your career, a bunch of accomplishments. Now you're a father. I just got to start like in general. How do you feel being the kid from Wisconsin and being who you are now? Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that and you kind of put it into perspective and you try and think back to when you were a kid, um, if you told my fifth grade self where I'd be today, uh, he'd be extremely thankful and extremely grateful for the situation that I'm in, um, which is a good thing. I'm glad. I'm glad that you put me into that perspective for a moment because, I mean, when you get into a micro sense, I'm, I'm in the middle of a season where our team hasn't done exactly what we wanted it to do, um, and we've, we've got some work ahead of us here. Um, but it is good to take a step back and to realize, you know, the scope of things and to, to understand where you are in the general sense of the world. And I'm very thankful for the life that I've had. Um, obviously, my son being born has been one of the biggest joys my wife and I have ever had. So uh, life ain't too bad. Well, that that makes me think, you know, someone like you, I think, would have some perspective on living in the moment and appreciating all that you've accomplished and what you have. I'm sure you go home to, you know, a nice home, maybe got some cars that you always wanted to get. Like that stuff is cool. But one thing I've always seen, we've talked to a lot of amazing executives or or, other athletes and stuff on the show. And the recurring theme is the idea of like not being complacent of how some of those toys are not maybe meaningless. Like you can understand your luxury your privilege, but like, that's not what's driving. You, you want to get out on the field. You have a situation where you had a heart condition and you, you were playing right after, you know, you were at the doctor, like, like tell us about what keeps someone going after they feel like they've seen it all and they have it all. I mean, I think that's the underlying drive that creates greatness for anyone, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a CEO, whatever you're in, 
in order to get to the pinnacle, in order to get to the top, you can't be driven by outside motivations. It has to be some fire that burns deep within you that no matter what the circumstances are, you're going to give everything you've got. You're going to sacrifice what you have to sacrifice to be successful. And you have to understand the big picture from a standpoint of, like you just said, you know, being thankful and being grateful for everything that you have, but you also have to be micro-focused on the day's task. And what am I going to do today that's going to get me one step, one inch, one moment closer to my goal? So we talked a bit about like what you've done on the field, but I'd say like you're among the players across the NFL, across sports, who's like really well known for what you've done outside of the sport. I believe you hosted SNL, right? You've had a few TV shows, um, you know, very well known for your, your philanthropy. Um, but yeah, let's talk about business a little bit. Like I see you're partnering with Athletic Brewing, um, you know, they help set up the conversation. So shout out to them. Uh, but in general, you got them and you're doing a lot of business. So what type of investments have you made? Um, what's your philosophy when it comes to business and, and companies and executive roles, you know, outside of, you know, being a defensive back? Yeah, I mean, obviously trying to take advantage of the situation that I'm in. I understand that as an athlete, we're in a very advantageous situation. We get opportunities. We get uh, a certain window of time. We have a platform to, to be able to do certain things. And so investing is one of those things that I've been fortunate enough to have people help me understand. I mean, I didn't know anything about it growing up. I didn't know anything about it in college even. Um, but as I've gone in my time in the NFL, wanting to take advantage of every opportunity I can, investing has become huge. And I try to invest in things, A, that are smart business decisions. I mean, I'm not an idiot. I'm not here to, to try and lose money. Um, but I also try and invest in things that I, I really believe in. And that's one of the reasons athletic growing has been so big for me is because when I met Bill, the founder, and he talked me through his philosophy and what he tries to do and the philanthropy that he's tied to athletic brewing on top of making an incredible product that also um, helps people who have alcohol issues, um, who helps people that don't have alcohol issues that just want to cut back on their drinking, who um, has done an incredible job with what he's trying to build. That really gets me going. And that's when I look into a founder's eyes and I hear them tell the story and their mission and what they're trying to accomplish, you really get a sense for where that business is going. And with Bill and Athletic and a lot of my other endeavors, um, you can see it right away. Yeah. What are some other uh, business moves that you're super proud of, whether it's an exit where you're just like, bro, I went from not knowing anything about investing to, you know, flipping something into millions. Um and just other things that have really like kind of like hit you in the heart where you're like, yo, there's a lot I can accomplish out here off the field. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate. I've had, I've had some, some really great opportunities. I mean, I'm a big guy in terms of taking care of my body, obviously I, being an athlete, it's extremely important. So Hyperize is a company that I got involved with and I wanted to really uh, focus on helping other athletes take, take care of their bodies. Um, Kenny Victor, who started Wheels Up, uh, went to Wisconsin. He was the Badger. He was on the sidelines for a lot of our games. And that relationship was built when I was a walkout at Wisconsin. He was building originally Marquee Jet, and now he's building Wheels Up. And I've gotten that opportunity. Um, did a great, we had a great run with Cholula. Cholula did great. Um, Bombas Socks, uh, Athletic Greens, um, Foxtrot Market. Um, we've got kickstand drinks, a uh, brand new alcoholic drink that's coming out now. I've dabbled with looking into like team ownership and, and sports and things like that. Um, haven't quite dove into that market yet, but really just enjoying looking around and taking advantage of opportunities. Um, Acorns is one, you know, they, they have a program where they, uh, give, you can invest, you can teach kids how to invest and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. It's been, it's been fun. And then you take a couple gambles, you take a couple shots. I mean, um, SpaceX came up a little while back. So, you know, you, you take some shots there and you hope that it goes incredibly well and hyperlink and things like that take off. Hey, you got a nice portfolio, JJ. <laughs> super, yeah, super diverse. You know, it's funny. It's like such a small world in this space because you talk about looking at founders' eyes. You know, Anthony Katz, founder of Mike Rice. Yeah, well, he was on here like you know, some episodes back. Um, great guy, though. Great philosophy. I rock with them. And then Athletic Greens, you know, some of the people, um, 
you know, behind FOS helping us out. Um, also work with them. And, you know, there's a lot of overlap. Like I think, you know, all those companies and then of course, you know, your primary employer, the NFL, we talk about business, like probably in the decade plus that you've been playing. Um, it's cool because we have sort of the same tra- trajectory, like being in college around the same time, like all this stuff. So I can, I can look at the nineties or the two thousands or now and have the same perspective as you. I'm like, Oh, we lived it in the same way. And like, tell me if I'm crazy. But when we were in college. People were just not as in tune with like the business side of the NFL as they are now. I don't remember Kat talking about $113 billion media rights. It was like, yeah, we knew, oh, CBS has Super Bowl or Fox has it this year. But like, you know, we, you know, everything and in part, you know, I'll give ourselves some credit for front of sports, but in general, the culture is like, Team sales, everybody's following the Broncos and what's happening and what's happening to team sales, the the deals, the apps, the, you know, the are they trying to divest NFL media? Is Apple going to get Sunday ticket? Like this stuff is is real in the news every day as much as like, you know, what's happening Monday night or all day on Sunday for, you know, for a lot, a lot of people are more tapped in with that. You know, they're looking at investment opportunities and stuff. And just how have you seen? the league grow over, you know, the past decade. I know you were like first round pick 2011. You have, you've had an up close look at it. So please like, like give us, give us some game. I think very similar to the world in general, but I think that in specifically talking about the NFL and the things that you're talking about, social media has been a massive aspect of that because people do want to take a a bigger dive into it. And the conversations do get bigger based around it. You know, back in the day, it's obviously it's in the newspaper. Um, You can go check out, you know, a, a website and see it, but you don't really see it as tactical as you can now, like where it's like in front of you and you can ask questions and people can start to say, hey, where's this money coming from? Where's that money going? How is this being split up? And I think that asking more questions has led to more answers, but it's also led to more transparency. I think it's created an opportunity where people are having to say, you know, what does that money trail look like? How is that revenue being split? How are, how are the players being compensated? And people are getting those answers. And then those answers are leading to more and more questions. And social media kind of has created that where everybody wants to know everything. And I'm sure there's times where that information doesn't want to be shared by certain people. But uh, it's been very interesting and fascinating to follow it. And I think it's only going to continue even further where the transparency has to continue. Um, and as players, obviously, the more that we can educate ourselves and the more that we can educate our entire league on how the revenue works and on how those streams are being split up and on where the data is being used and everything that goes on with what we're doing and how that's being shared, I think the better off we're going to be in terms of future CBAs. You mentioned kind of taking an early look at, at ownership and it's crazy. I was looking at a list and there's so many different franchises that are up for sale, whether, you know, you're looking at, um, over there, I think like uh, Washington, the Nationals have uh, have some stuff going on, or the Suns now, or the Broncos just sold. So like a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, like the Commanders just started exploring to sell, right? They tap Bank of America to look into that for them. So lots of teams selling, people hopping in. Bezos going to buy a team. Oh, the Walmart Air does buy a team. Like you know, are we going to get a black owner? Like. There's so much stuff going on. You said that you were even considering or like eyeing the prospect of dipping your toes. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years we get a headline. J.J. Watt, you know, buys this team with ownership group. But but tell us how you're thinking about it now. You've been in the game for time. You made some good money. I'm sure you have a lot of friends, you know, a few billionaires. Like, like how are you looking at that as a potential investment? And also just the idea of – how NFL ownership has changed. Every single one of these sales, they're like, so-and-so bought it in 2005 for $300 million, and then they sell it for several billion. It's like, this is madness right now. So so how are you thinking about it in the midst of it? Right. I think, I think you see a lot of people trying to also find those next opportunities. What is that next NFL where you can, you know, a team owner bought it for $50 million in 1990 and now selling it for $5 billion or whatever it may be. And so you see people dabbling in pickleball. You see people dabbling in these other leagues. And 
obviously the NFL is the NFL and nobody has really been able to duplicate that from a sense, but you're trying to find those opportunities. And I think that from an investment standpoint and ownership, it's, it's all about trying to find the right opportunity because I, I have nowhere near the amount of money to buy a majority stake in an NFL team, not even remotely in the realm of possibility. But you look at an opportunity like, let's say, like like Rexham and Ryan Reynolds and what, what Ryan Reynolds and Ryan McElhinney are doing at Rexham. Um, obviously, that's an opportunity that is actually feasible for somebody um, who is in my shoes. Now, it's also a massive amount of work. It's a massive amount of responsibility. But that's where you can go in and be an owner and actually make changes and actually do things. Now, you put in, let's say, $5 million into a $5.5 billion NFL valuation, you're calling up the guy who's actually owning the team and saying, hey, I think we should do this. I should. And he's saying, how much did you put in again? You know, like, like right. it's, you have to get the right situation. And if you can find that situation where you are in an ownership group where they value your opinion and they do trust what you've seen because you've been in the league, then it's an opportunity. Um, I think there's other situations where you're just kind of a, a brief headline on the day the team is bought. And then you're just riding it out, and maybe they'll sell someday and you make a little bit, but you just kind of toss, toss your coin in the pond, you know? Right. Do you, do you think you'll be an NFL team, team owner one day? I, I don't see it. I mean, what I'd like to, absolutely. I mean, the league's unbelievable, what it's doing, and, and the way it's continued to grow. I mean, even a part anyway. owner, by the way, like even, you know, having a right. piece of a, of a team. It's kind of like we just talked about right there. Like, if there's an opportunity where I was, where there was a, a chance that I was passionate about and the majority owner um, was somebody that I felt um, was going to do an incredible job and also I had a chance to have some input that was actually value-added input, not just, you know, standing by and stamping my name on it. Um, I would love that opportunity and I would welcome it. Um, but I think more realistically, um, there's, there's just other opportunities that would be more advantageous for me personally. So another yeah. team you want to... And, uh, and wants my input, I'm all, I'm all for it. Right. Well, what about something more feasible? Like, are you do you want to buy a soccer team over in some town in Europe or anything like that? It definitely interests me. Um, there's definitely an interest there for me. I don't know even that situation, majority ownership, the responsibility, and you basically have to pick yourself up and move there to really do it fully the right way or at least have somebody to extremely trust in that role. Um, but I do think that a percentage – of uh, soccer team would definitely interest me. I think my wife plays soccer. I've been very interested in soccer. Um, I've really leaned heavily into European soccer in the last five to ten years. And that is something with the passion, the fan base, the history, the tradition, uh, that definitely does hold some interest in me. Yeah, I saw I saw you watching the World Cup closely. I wish I wish our boys could have got it done. But like you said, on the 2026, right? We're hosting it. Let's bring it home. I know. I know. We've got we've got the opportunity there. We've obviously got to try and continue to grow and improve. But yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's better, it's better than I've ever seen. And and the fact that your wife is a soccer star. I mean, my kids are in soccer. All my friends are up watching Premier League early on Saturdays. Uh, the culture has changed. Again, we grew up in the same time. So, you know, when we're in middle right. school and everybody's basketball, baseball, football, very American, you know, maybe somebody's playing tennis or, you know, something like that. But, like, the way that soccer has a hold on these kids now, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, and I think with the World Cup, understanding how big of a deal it is for the entire world and how – important and fabric it's built into people's lives uh, in other countries and in other cultures. I think that we're really starting to see that and I think I think we're really starting to get a hold of what that meaning is here and I, I still don't think we're anywhere near full saturation in terms of soccer viewership here and I think it's going to get grow and grow with the Olympics, with the World Cup. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it grow. Yeah, I think it's like a, I, and I love thinking long term, I think it's it's like a 2030s type of thing that we'll start to see like the real changes. But, you know, they've been hyping it up since we hosted the World Cup in 94. It was always like America's about to. And, and now it's actually starting to happen because they've been promising it for 20, 30 years. But now I'm like, oh, wow, another decade or so. And the rate at which the world is like globalizing. Um, 
you know, we're on our way. So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. See? Hey, see? I, I, I love the front office sports perspective. You talked about it, how I like some of the tweets and I retweet some of the tweets because I, I love the business perspective behind everything. And I think that fans are also starting to really enjoy that aspect of things. I think that more people are really tuning in to the business behind sports, not just the fandom. Uh, I mean, even with now sports gambling, with fantasy sports, with the way the fans are consuming it, people aren't just a fan of their one team and only watch that one team anymore. Now they're into fantasy. They're watching other teams. They're watching other leagues. Uh, they're gambling on things. And everybody's interested in contracts and team valuations. And it's fascinating. You guys do a great job, so I appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, since we're talking a little bit about, about Europe, I'm kind of obsessed with this whole trajectory over in, in Europe for the NFL. Like you got Goodell saying, I think we could have two teams in London. I think we could have a European division. Like, I don't know if you've ever gotten out there. Pretty much like every team at some point is, is going out and playing – you know, in London or, you know, they got Germany now. Mexico City is in Europe, but part of the international expansion. I just saw something. In fact, you know, we published something the other day about how they're trying to get in Spain and France. And it's just like clearly, you know, the failed NFL Europe experiment of the 2000s is like long behind us. And there's like this serious effort now to legitimize it over there. What? Is that like from a player perspective, do you actually see it? Do you think it's novelty and it's like, okay, cool. It's some international dollars. Or do you see it where it's like, we could have a, we could have a division. We could play a Super Bowl in London. Um, Is it realistic or not? I mean, I think it's fascinating when you look at it from a standpoint of how committed the NFL has been to it. So you look at Premier League, for example. Premier League is, is potentially the biggest soccer league in the entire world, followed all around the world. But here in America, people look closely. The only true commitment from the Premier League to the American viewership has been preseason games. You know, they come over for some preseason tournaments and things like that, and fans love it. It's incredible. But what the NFL has done is they have put real, meaningful, regular season games over in Europe. So they've put that level of commitment in saying, hey, we appreciate that you guys are watching our games. We want to we wanna put this stage in front of you. We're going to take these logistical, extremely challenging steps to do that. And they're trying very hard to build that. Now, putting a team over there permanently, putting multiple teams over there, that becomes a very difficult logistical challenge. Do I think that they'll find a way if they believe it's a very monetizable opportunity? Absolutely, because you'll, you'll always find a way. Right. Um, but I can say personally, from my personal experience, I take a trip to Europe at least probably every other off season at, at, at most. And from 10 years ago until now, you know, 10 years ago, you're walking around the streets and nobody really says anything. Nobody knows anything. I, I, the last two trips I went to Europe uh, in Italy at the Trevi Fountain, it was one of the coolest experiences of my entire life. This guy was wearing my shoes at the Trevi Fountain. It was unbelievable. It blew my mind. My wife and I were it was just it blew my mind. And then this past trip to London, we we were walking down the street and it turned into a little bit of a, a thing. And a woman came up to me wearing socks with my face on. And I'm just like, this I wouldn't remember you shared that it. too. Yeah. So like viewership and, and awareness and the way that fans understand football over there has grown so much. And obviously, it's only going to continue to grow with the, the more that we work to spread it over there. Yeah, it's going to be really fun to see. There's so many. There's so many things, whether it's like soccer in the U.S. or or the, I guess, really the exchange of like NFL in Europe. Both of those, I really want to see how they play out over the next decade. I know, and I, I've been fat. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm a huge Premier League fan. So to see how that has been so successful over here, despite all the challenges, like you say, you know. Soccer hasn't been the biggest sport. It's been growing, but it hasn't been the biggest. They don't play regular season games over here, yet we're still so interested in it and so fascinated by it. I think that's that's what we're trying to do, obviously, with the NFL, but in an even bigger way by putting real games. Yeah, totally. So um, I wanted to ask, I thought of this when you talked about your situation uh, in London and honestly just in general, um, you know, you have a lot of fans like, what is it like having fame? Like, you know, you're not a pop star, right? You're not like Bieber trying to go into a restaurant. But at the same time, you probably get recognized everywhere. You probably have people come up to you all the time. Um, 
I always just like hearing like what that what that's like, you know, like like again, it's almost like one of those things we talk about. Oh, you know, I've made so much money now. Cool. Congrats. But also you were just a kid in Wisconsin who now people you've never met have an interest in and they will come up to you in public and let you know that. And what has that been like for you over the past, you know, 10 years since you've entered like the public sphere? Yeah, I think I think. You go through phases of it, for sure. I think that anybody who's kind of been through it would tell you that you definitely go through phases of it. I mean, at the beginning, it's literally unbelievable. You can't fathom the fact that people are coming up to you asking for your photo, asking for your autograph, wearing your jersey, taking your picture. It's the coolest thing in the world, um, and you're just enjoying every single moment of it. And then I think there's well, there definitely is a time where there's either an event or something happens, or, like, like I mean, for example, like I had a Halloween one year where my house just got flooded with people. I mean, just absurd. Like it got out of control. And then you're like, okay, this is getting intense. I got to take a step back and make sure that my family's safe, make sure that everybody around me is safe. And you get a little dark and you get a little jaded per se. But then you also, then you kind of realize like, but this is still the coolest thing in the world. And this, I have a job. I have this house. I have these opportunities because of all these unbelievable people. I mean, the greatest example ever of the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in terms of fame was when when we raised forty two million dollars after Hurricane Harvey. I mean, if I if I didn't have the job that I had with the, the people around me, I never would have been able to do that. And fans and people from all over the world, people that probably didn't even know me before, um, but somehow our reach was able to do something magical for people all over Houston at that time. And I'll forever be thankful, and I'll forever be grateful. Um, to fans because of what they did then, because of what they've done for me and my family, and because my son and my son's son and my son's son's son are now going to have great lives because of these people who support me. Well said. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, that was that that definitely was an incredible effort. I think a lot of people got to know you through that, um, you know, and inspired people. And I think philanthropy is a big part of what's attached to your name now, which, you know, I'm sure you're proud of. And, you know, whether it's something like raising millions of dollars uh, for hurricane relief, or I think even the fact that like this personal connection you have with fans, you flew a family out from the United Kingdom who you promised you would get to an NFL game. Talk about the exchange between Europe and the NFL. Look at that. I saw you flew a family out. Uh, you know, the kid who he built the replica stadium and, uh, you know, of the Texas stadium where you were at. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've sh- struck this relationship. Um, I also am really intrigued by this kid who I think the parlay, he blew a thousand dollar parlay. It was it was a bad call. You felt bad about it on the field. You felt bad that a fan lost a thousand bucks. He you know, he has the audacity to message you on Twitter show you an ad and then you say, I got you covered. I'm going to take care of it. Send me your address. Um, one, can you just tell me how that whole situation went down? Like, how did that actually, did you just catch up to kid? Like, you know, are you, are you texting with him? Like, Hey, how you doing kid? Like, don't gamble too much. Like, like how is that one going? And then in general, that your connection with real people flying fans out, raising money, like, like what, does that mean in the scope of like who JJ Watt is? Yeah. No, I mean, I'll, I'll first give you how all that went down. Cause it's, I mean, it's interesting. Like after a game, uh, obviously, you know, you're with the teammates in your locker room, you shower up, you do your media obligations. Then you go sit on the bus and I call my first thing I always do is FaceTime my wife. I talk to my wife. We talk about the game. Uh, I'll text my brothers, I'll text my parents. And then you're just kind of waiting on the bus for a good chunk of time. Uh, until, you know, you take off to the airport. And there's, there's plenty of time where I'm looking at my phone. You know, you're taking a look, you're scrolling through Twitter, you're just seeing what's going on. And for me, uh, I saw, I can't remember exactly when I saw it. I can't remember if it was on the bus for this next day, but I saw I saw this guy's tweet. Uh, I was personally, obviously, upset about not scoring a touchdown. I wanted to score, and I thought it was fair for me to score. Um, I saw his tweet, and I was like, you know what, this guy got screwed. I, I, so I'll, I'll take care of this guy. Um, and then in the most beautiful way ever, he donated it back and matched it. So he donated it to charity, um, my charity, which was incredible of him. And it was kind of a perfect pay it forward scenario. 
Um, but as you know, in today's world, that has now turned into my mentions being flooded with sports gambling losses and everybody wanting me to pay off their bets. Um, but I think that's kind of the beauty of it, too, is I get to pick and choose who I interact with and what I want to do. And there's some days where I'll just be like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to feel like interacting with people today. And and then there's other times where something incredible pops up, like the kid from the UK creating our stadium out of Legos, or there's, you know, uh, kids running a lemonade stand with, you know, donating their profits to my foundation or whatever it may be. And I always want to try and reward true fans. And if I see something that pops up that looks organic, that looks real, that doesn't look like it's like, you know, trying to get money, trying to get an autograph, um, I'm always going to try and interact with that because I want to encourage that real, authentic interaction. And I always want to show the fans that I appreciate them because I do. Um, I really do. I remember a fan in Germany got my face tattooed on his leg one time. And I mean, that just blows my mind. And any, any of those situations where people are just showing their support and it seems real and true, I'm so thankful for it. Yeah, philanthropy in general, giving back, you know, how do you, how do you carve out space for that in your life? Uh, you know, do you have just people that you work with that keep that as like a constant priority of what you're doing. Like I said, like you're kind of known for this at this point. So just in between the practices and the investments and the kid and the wife, like, you know, how do you make time to give back? Yeah, I try and do, like you said, I just try and compartmentalize. I mean, my mom uh, helps me run my foundation. She's incredible at it. She does a great job um, of doing that. And other than that, it's just a matter of finding time, trying to find opportunities where you can, um, do little things to give back where you can find opportunities and ways. Um, game days are one of my favorites because it's a chance to meet fans. It's a chance to meet kids. I mean, I only got to go to like, one NFL game in my life when I was a kid, and it was the coolest experience in the world. And I was up in the nosebleeds. I was nowhere near the front row. But um, any chance I get a chance to meet kids at the game, I think it's try and make a memorable experience because I know what it would have been like for me to meet a player, or to play catch with a player. Um, so just... That's one of those things you're always trying to remember that we get to live this life every single day. For us, it becomes a daily routine. But somebody meeting us or somebody coming to a game to watch us, that's maybe their one and only time ever that they get to see us. And you have to try and remember that in your interactions. And you have to try and make it special um, and play your best game because that might be the one time they get to see you live. So when you're scrolling through Twitter and everything, obviously you see trolls, you see hate. Are you just kind of like immune to that at this point, or does it or does it get to you? You have a game that you did not feel great about, and then somebody's like, you know, poking you right where it hurts. Um, I don't know. Is which way does it go? <laughs> Sensitive or it out or somewhere in the middle? I've had to just like I said. There's cycles with fame. There's kind of cycles with that as well. Um, especially because I mean, like you said, we came up kind of at the same time. We were around when Twitter started. Um, so you're kind of going through Twitter, figuring it out. And then there comes a time where trolls start to come around. And I had never dealt with that before. I had no idea how to deal with that. So the negativity hurt. I mean, that it cut because you didn't know, like, oh, some of these people are just being idiots. Some of these people are just trying to get a rise out of me. Can I just say real quick, I love when I see the JJ Watts or whoever reply. And then the person immediately stops trolling. They're like, I love you. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> KD's great at that. I love when KD does it because he, he'll clap back at anybody at any time, and I love it. And they usually fold, though. They're usually like, I was just kidding. I wanted to get a response. I love you. Anybody who's, I mean, 95% of people who are, who are coming at you on Twitter, if they met you in real life or saw you, they'd ask for a picture and autograph. So that's kind of one of those things that in the beginning, you don't really remember because, like I said, we we're coming up with it. It never really happened. Um, but now, as I go through it, I fully understand it. And like, if I play a shitty game, I know I played a shitty game. Like, I, if, if I'm going on Twitter and somebody tells me you played a shitty game, I'm like, yeah, no, no, it was that. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you do. Yeah, I, I got to play better. Um, but it's, it took me a while to get over it, for sure. And the, the thing that kind of scares me is I was an adult dealing with that. Like, when I was learning how to handle that, I was an adult. And I still am dealing with it, and I'm an adult. There's kids nowadays that are trying to deal with those emotions and with those thoughts in their heads. And if you're in middle school or you're in high school and you're trying to, you know, grow up and deal with all the things you're trying to deal with in regular life, but now you're also trying to deal with trolls and online bullies, man, that, that would be very, very difficult. And that's, Bro, even that's, outside of the hate, like, I think, I think generally the fact that these kids have, have gotten to a space where even in high school they can market themselves, they can make money, you got NIL, all of this stuff – it's awesome. 
But, man, I, I played ball. Obviously, I didn't make it to the pros like you, but I played a few sports growing up. And it's like I could not imagine high school. These kids are on camera now. Like, you made it to the pros, and you didn't have the pressure of your friggin' high school games. Every single person there, like, having footage. Oh, DJ Watt, this it's great. There's the pressure of how great he can be. Oh, he messed up. He's actually – the hype isn't real. It's like they're dealing with that constantly. I feel for them. So I 100% agree. So some of my best pass rush moves have come out of failures. When I've gotten knocked on my ass trying a move, it didn't work, but I did learn that if I try this move, it might work. Now, you take some of these high school kids or these college kids or even NFL guys, and you have cameras around 24-7, or you have, obviously we have game film that people break down 24-7. If you try a pass rush move and you get knocked on your ass, that's going to be on the internet, and they're going to be talking about it, tweet about it. So then what happens? That guy gets scared to do that, to try a new pass rush move again. And now he's not growing and developing as a player because all he wants, you think you have to have success 24-7. Nobody is successful 24-7. If you put together a tape of my lowlights, you could make me look like the worst player on the planet. If you put together a tape of my highlights, I'll look like the best player on the planet. It's crazy that these kids are not dealing with that and they don't necessarily have that capacity to understand, I have to fail to succeed. And we are, we're not giving people the opportunity to fail anymore. Like some of these kids, like you said, if you got an NIL deal, you're like, shoot, I gotta, I gotta perform. I gotta be at my best. Yeah. But if you fail, it's okay. Get yourself, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and try again. That means you're trying something. You're trying to be great. Yeah, we had uh, CJ Stroud on the show, and I loved his mentality because he was like, man, during the season, I'm not really on like that. Like, I am posting my obligations for my brand deals, and I'm focused on practice and focused on the team. So I think, you know, the next great generation of athletes, although some of them will probably take well to the shine from a young age, I think it'd be great if a lot of them understood, like, yo, I could tap out and just work on my game. I could have a workout in the gym that's not filmed. That's not on TikTok, you know, like, let me just do this for myself and for my future. So um, I want to give them advice. And, and there's there's two sides of the coin, because you do want to say, grow your brand, build your content, because that is an opportunity for you to succeed off the field and make money and to build a platform. Like I said, I never would have been able to do half the things I've done if it wasn't for the platform. And that's partially because of social media. But at the same time, we also want to say, shelter yourself and, and make sure that you're just doing the work in the darkness and everything. And trust me, I'm the same way sometimes. I've posted many workouts and there's many workouts that I haven't posted. And it's, it's that constant battle of we want kids to build their brand and build their opportunity, but we also want to, and there's no right answer that there is no right answer. Everybody can do it different ways, but it's, it's a fascinating discussion. Absolutely is. And uh, I love your perspective on it. So I have like a couple really quick things here. I'm really enjoying the conversation. I also know, you know, you got places to, to be. Um, but do you have a couple minutes here for a speed round on a couple last topics? I do. I do. I got a couple minutes and then I'm headed out to a Gatorade obligation. Speaking of uh, speaking <laughs> of obligations, I'm off to Gatorade. All right, cool. So we'll get right into it. You love Sour Patch Kids. You were on Hard Knocks eating them, but you only like the blue and the orange ones. And then they sent you a two-pound box. Is that box finished? It is not because I only eat two a day. But it's damn harder to eat two a day. And my teammates are ravaging them. Two a day. You have a lot of discipline. Wow. I have to. I have to. It's hard, man. Damn. i, I got to give that a try. What do you think of the explosion of women's soccer? They got they're selling out Wembley Stadium. That's the most watched soccer match ever is one of the years at the Women's World Cup. You know, we won. Like, we're our women's team is iconic, much better than our men's team. Um, there's so much going on. Like, there's so much going on. The viewership, the attendance, it's all, you know, record. Record setting every other month, it seems. Your wife, Chicago Red Stars, you're both athletes. You've seen this up close and personal. Um, what do you have to say about that entire phenomenon? I think that we are only seeing the very beginning of what women's soccer is going to be. I think it's going to be absolutely massive. Um, it's one of the ownership opportunities that I've been trying to get into and trying to find my way into the right opportunity um, because I think that women's soccer is only scratching the surface of what it's going to be. Okay. Um, 
you know I love a good follow up question where I'm gonna just get right into the next. Um, one cool story that comes to mind in terms of uh, a run in that you had a, a hero that you met another a quarterback you know in the league whether it's you know it's it's Brady or it's just someone who we all know and love like what's one of those things that you're just like this was a cool moment I met a hero or even I met a peer and it was like wow we made it oh that's a, that's a great question um I mean I grew up I, I mean, I think for me, one of the coolest things was when I got down here and uh, Pat Tillman's family, uh, we had a conversation and I, I asked them, it was actually, I have to take a step back. This was, this was before I got here. This is kind of crazy how it all worked out. So I, I had a Reebok shoe for five years. We had, we had five iterations of my shoe. And in my last shoe, every single year, I do one version um, that we do like a special one and we donate profits, proceeds. We did a Navy SEAL one. We did an Army one for my grandpa. And then I got down here and I did a, Navy, uh, a Pat Tillman one. And I called the family and I asked if I asked Marie if she would allow me to do it. Um, she did. She approved all the designs. She worked with me on it. Um, so that was that was an incredible one, is having them on my side and being willing to do that. Um, in terms of celebrity or, or athlete, um, and I know you probably have dozens, but I, I, I just, you know, if you have anything for the people where you're like, okay, cool story. No one's ever asked me about this. I'll just, I'll just throw it out there real quick. I mean, for me, I'll go a little out of the box because I think the NFL, like with this whole, a lot of this conversation has been about soccer. So for me, when I met Sergio Aguero um, and he was in Houston doing a preseason tour and I got to hang out with him and we've become friends since. And so we're, we're good friends there. Um, the other time, the other time that was crazy, which this, this is another thing where I had no idea that football was growing this nationwide or worldwide. Uh, the Mexican national team, El Tri, they were in Houston training for uh, uh, an event. And so I said, hey, can I go watch, watch those guys practice? So I showed up to their practice and I walked in and literally they went bananas. And I was, I literally, I think when I walked in, I literally looked behind me like, what are they going crazy for? Because I, I thought there's zero chance these guys know anything about you know American football, and they it was they knew all about our team. They knew about me. It was it was one of the coolest things ever meeting the Mexican national team in Chicharito uh, and those guys. That was really cool. Awesome. Well, last thing, JJ, before you get out to your busy life, um, I guess this is about the rest of your life. Everyone's saying you're going to retire. You're retiring at the end of the season. You know, the speculation's out there, but I want to hear from the source what what's happening next for, for you. I got five games to focus on before I think about any of that. I got I got a baby boy at the house. I got five more games here of the regular season and hopefully more. We got to do some damn good work here in these next five games, hopefully more. Um, but I got five games right now that I'm focused on. And, and I'll think about all that after the season and talk about it with my wife, um, who also is a professional athlete. We're having conversations about what she wants to do as well. So um, we're going to have a big family conversation at the end of this year. But for right now, I'm just focused on ball. All right. Well, good luck with the rest of the season. Really appreciate you taking the time to jump on. And that's it, man. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank the homie J.J. Watt for coming out, keeping it super real with us. Love his perspective on life, on business, of course, on the NFL. I'm wishing all of you the best of luck, best of success in 2023. We got a couple more episodes here. But really, when I look back, I'm really proud of this journey. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate everybody who's hit me up. You know, everybody who's come on as a guest, we've had so many cool people, whether it's athletes and celebrities to the executives and the CEOs who really help shape our culture. We started this back in the summer and look at us now. It's the end of the year. So we got a couple more episodes. Like I said, we're going to close out this year strong before we know it. It's going to be 2023. I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.